Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome um, Lance and Pat. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Innovation Special Interest Group. Um, the, another team member, Veronica, who unfortunately is not here tonight, had the idea after seeing Lance's presentation at an unnamed uh, other ASTZ chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we, in, uh, we dialogued with him and uh, enlisted his support in uh, kicking off uh, tonight's event, um, Innovation in Performance Improvement and Training. And so um, let me tell you a little, about, a little bit about my personal interest in this. Um, for the past 14 months, I've been working on a project that has been nothing but change, 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 ambiguity, constant change, and more change. And so I finally said, look, this is an agile project. And so I started looking into that and, and got really interested in that. And now I'm um, in a new position where um, at PG&E they're, they're rewriting some work procedures and we're trying to uh, align the instruction with these work procedures that are being written at, guess what, agile speed and sprints. So I have a very personal, professional interest in this topic right now. And um, so um, let me introduce Lance. Lance is an independent management consultant, author, and speaker based in San Francisco and serving clients worldwide. Um, he brings to his work more than 30 years experience in adult education and training, communication and change management, organizational design and development, and new technologies and business re-engineering. And you may have seen him at other events. He is a regular speaker and keynote presenter everywhere. Um, Pat is an experienced Agile executive coach, transform transformational leader, and trainer with proven success, transforming large Agile organizations and developing world-class enterprise Agile processes and practices. And she will I'm sure she will tell you all the places she has worked and projects she is currently working on. And um, without further ado, let me turn it over to Lance. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the dramatic entrance, but you know, I had to watch the America's Cup. You know, America wants everybody. Like that. So it is useful to be a billionaire. <laughs> uh, but the, what I and then I was working on the slide deck as I was driving down because my wife was kind enough to drive down so I could be in the commute lane. But it still took nine minutes. So you got to understand, I'm spending three hours to spend 15 minutes with you. So. You really should laugh about that because really it means that it's really an important topic. So I'm at the end of my career, um, and so when you look back over, it's almost 40 years now, and you see what hasn't happened, you begin to get really upset. So those of you who may know me, probably know my reputation in the industry is a little bit of a uh, pain in the ass, but the title that I carry is Creative Abrasion. <laughs> and that was given to me by one of my clients when he was swearing at me about what I was doing. And we went and researched the, the topic, and actually it was a management topic in 1970, very popular. And it's based on a very simple scientific principle, is if you put sand in an oyster, you get a pearl. I'm the sand. You're the oyster. So just so you're clear, I'm not nice, I'm really blunt, and I'm really pissed off at where learning and development is after 40 years. So. That's the context. So this all began over in Mount Diablo. Actually, I've been on this topic for the last year because I've been in the, in the almost retirement. I'm trying to retire, and I keep on getting invited to do things. So I'm in that part of my career, a different part than your career. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of things about rethinking and sort of getting people to think differently. So that's how this whole thing began because I've did this presentation at ASC International. It's been done at Devlin, the eLearning Guild. Actually, the, if you want to see a complete webinar on this, on the 9th, I'm doing a whole webinar on this topic. Uh, you can go on my website, you can see all the slides. And we're not going to do all that tonight. In 15 minutes, I'm just trying to set up the context for what you, what's going to happen a little bit later on. I think this actually, when I saw this on the internet, I was searching for something about innovation. I went, wow, I couldn't design that. I didn't know you could have a bicycle that didn't have gears. I didn't know you didn't, could have a bicycle that didn't have a pillar between here and here to hold up a seat. I didn't know you could design a bicycle that didn't have a, a hub and a bunch of spokes. I didn't know you could design a bicycle that the back wheel didn't have a hub and the spoke was connected. And that's when it like, 
you know, the, the, the blinding light of the obvious was, I'm just not a very good designer. Really, I'm not a good bike designer. Because I would have immediately said, well, you got a bike, you got a spokes, you got a hub, you got gears, because that's what I know. And to me, this is a metaphor of our industry. We don't design this. We design tricycles. <laughs> and we're happily designing tricycles. And what we've done is we've gotten better at designing tricycles. But we haven't gotten to this. We don't design this. I've not seen this. I've not seen any learning that looks like this. I see incrementally better structural led training. I see incrementally better audio-based training. I see incre incrementally better PowerPoint-based training. I see incrementally better e-learning, whatever that is. Everything is incrementally better. But I haven't seen huge shifts in the whole of the 40 years I've worked. I began in computer-assisted instruction. I worked on computer-based training, web-based training, e-learning, electronic performance support, artificial intelligence, um, social learning, social media. You know, the whole gamut. I've done the whole thing. So, it's actually 40 years. This is a picture of me here 40 years later. I don't have the answer. That really pisses me off. That's why I drove an hour and a half. Because I want you to take on this challenge. That's why I think this innovation SIG has the possibility of doing something that nobody else is doing, which is actually questioning what the industry is about. AFTD is a huge monolith. It doesn't change much. I know Tony. I've been a member for 30 years. Incrementally, it's moved maybe a degree. That's a not very much. We're giving certifications on skills that are actually in the past. We're not doing stuff much in the future. So when Veronica and then Susan took on and said, well, wait, in South Bay we'll have an innovation SIG and we would really try and do something different, I said, okay, I'll help. And that's why I drove an hour and a half to spend 50 minutes with you, to try and get you excited about what's possible. So that it moves from me being annoyed and angry about it to you being excited and doing something about it. Is that a good transition? What do you think? Yeah. Yes, no, maybe? Not what you thought you were going to hear from me, I bet, was it? Okay, so I had a couple slides. I, as I was driving, I was like, Elliot maybe says you shouldn't show slides, you should just tell stories. Elliot's an old friend of mine. But I know that you don't want to look at me all that long. So if I have a picture behind me, you can listen to me and look at a better picture. So that's what these 10 slides are. Paul Valeri, the philosopher, I just love his quote, that the trouble of our times is the future is not what it used to be. If you don't get that, you really are heavy, heavy the same. Right? And every day is different, it's not the same. There were trimorans, I mean catamarans with 72 foot wings flying across the bay at 50 miles an hour and everybody told Ellison it couldn't be done. Last year he didn't even know how to do it. Three, eight days ago they didn't know how to sail boats and they did it today. So, you know, things move pretty quickly. We know that but in our industry we are the most change resistant industry I know. Because we all say, yeah, 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 I know that and we go about doing these things the exact same way. So it's very interesting. So. Just a couple quick pictures, so you get it. So this was about how I always thought it was. You help people identify a need, you develop some kind of learning or an intervention, and then they went and did something. Maybe you did some evaluation. Maybe you did a Kirkpatrick's four levels. Everybody know Kirkpatrick's four levels? Right, now he's got the fifth level. At least he has moved incrementally. Because <laughs> he wrote a paper in 1950, and we're still using it today, and he finally added, now actually his daughter has picked it up, and son, or daughter-in-law and son, so maybe we'll have a sixth or seventh level. But they used to be a lot of time. I used to, I mean, it, well, you can drive from San Francisco to San Jose in under 90 minutes, but, uh, but this is what the world is today, because nobody has any time. So basically people say, I have a need, and I want a solution, I want it when? Like yesterday, yesterday, not tomorrow. If you say, well, it won't be very good, what do they say? I don't care, it'll be good enough. And we don't get that. We still try and push back and go, well, I mean, but, 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 you know. And that's what people want. They wanted it immediately. Another big change is this whole notion of where people are when they want this stuff. I mean, it used to be that we're, you know, here we're here in time and place. Huge, huge cost to me to get here. Not so great cost to you. So that's why I have to be really emotional and put a lot of energy. We could have been virtual, but none of us were here. I could have come in on a webinar where you were here and I was happily at home. Yeah, that would have been nice. Or we could have you know, posted this and gone like a, a MOOC and you know, all gone to a website and studied. I mean, that's all good. But what's, the reality is now people don't want to have to choose. They want it any time, any place. So that is, the, that is the metaphor that we're working in. Even if people say, well, we want learning, they don't necessarily want it in a box or a classroom. They want it all the time, anytime, any place, 
wherever they want it, on any device they want it, bring your own device, bring your own learning, whatever it is. When I began, you know, these were four things that I was trained to develop. You know, information, research, um, like online performance support, documentation, technical writing, can anybody do that? User manuals, all that good stuff. Then I was told, well, you can develop learning, instructor-led training, self-based training, web-based training, video-based training, self-study-based training, you know, all that good stuff. You could create support systems, you know, you know, advice and support, buddy systems, things like that. Or you could build better tools, and then you don't need to do any of that stuff. But I thought, well, then that's what I actually had a business for 15 years in the Bay Area called the Dublin Group. We had 100 people, very successful. We built all these solutions for major clients all over the world. And then they shifted, and clients began to say, I don't want one or the other. I want them all. I, I, don't, want, I don't want to choose because there's not a way I can tell you what I need. I need them all, all the time. So I need access to great tools, great support, great information, great learning. Well, that's different than this. Duh, huh? I can design this. But designing this is a different problem. We've had this huge debate, because my colleague Jay Croft wrote a book called Informal Learning, and everybody thought he invented informal learning, but I've got to tell you that's not really true. And Jay Croft did not invent informal learning, just like Elliot Macy didn't invent e-learning, I didn't invent e-learning, all this stuff was way before it. But we got to this dichotomy that said there is formal stuff or there's informal stuff, and you have to choose between the two. Oh man, I want informal, it's cool. Wow, oh, yeah, man, everybody's just going to talk and it's going to be great. We're going to send emails and blogs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, because, no, we need formal, we need structure. And we get this huge debate about where it should be. Well, the world said, forget that. We don't care about formal and informal. It's got to be in context. And you've got to give me the content I need and the context I need and the tools to access it. And it's not a choice between formal and informal. I want it all. I want formal, I want informal, I want semi-formal, I want sort of, sort of formal, a little bit informal. I want blogs and all this kind of stuff. But you've got to give it to me in the context in which I can use it. Different. So that is what it was. This is where we're headed. That's what it was. This is where we're headed. Now, when I began, this is what I thought I was. I thought this was me. I was cool. I developed solutions that helped my clients get to the goal. Isn't that what you do? Don't you help people? Come on, tell me the truth. Isn't that what you do? You help people. You develop solutions that's going to help them do what they need to do. True or false? <laughs> if you said false, you should be in the other room. And you think you do it well or good. People pay you to do it, right? You all have jobs? Right? So you're, you're here. You have this little kit. And you look at this problem here, and you analyze it, and you try and figure out how you're going to solve it. Look at that, and look at the edges, and well, I don't know. And, and I've been doing that. I've been doing it 40 years. I get paid a lot of money to do it. I had a company that did it. I was pretty good at it. But then something shifted. Two things happened. One is all these people began to talk about time. They really didn't care about the solution. All they wanted was it when? Yes. Yesterday. And if I said, yeah, but I can build it better, what did they say to me? No, yesterday. And then they said, by the way, see this little happy device? I don't want it on my desktop. I wouldn't even have desktops anymore. Do any of you have desktops? My kid got his first job, and the first thing he got was a MacBook Air. He doesn't even have a desk, let alone a desktop. He works out of his house, his studio apartments, with his, his iPhone and his MacBook Air, and that's how he started his working career. So when you say, you know, and that is more and more what's happening, you know, this whole notion of bringing your own devices. So now to be a solution developer, you've got to figure this out. You've got this time clock running in your head that every minute that you're not delivering the solution is a problem to this person. Not to you, because you're not that person. But every minute you're delaying, they're not getting what they need. And they're telling you that, hey, I got this cool little device I'm carrying around. Why don't you use it? Why don't you use it? So that's different. The other thing that's really different that I've learned is I used to believe this, which is that this is the impact, right? So low impact, high impact. Did everybody get the four square model? Low investment, high investment. We got that? <clears throat> In my career, I pretty much learned that if you didn't spend a lot of money, you didn't get much impact. True? I mean, that's what it used to be. Spend more money, and if you do a good job, you should get more impact. I know everybody's going to say, yeah, but you do it. But theoretically, isn't that true? Yeah. You get a Hyundai car at $10,000, you get plastic and roll-up windows. 
You buy a Rolls Royce at a five hundred thousand dollars, you get leather, V twelve engine, people that service it, and you look cool, <laughs> right? That is the way the world was, and actually, this was the whole IT system: spend a little more, spend a little more. Now, what you want is people want this. They go, wait a second, why can't I have a lot of impact at no money at all? Why can't I learn everything I need in a minute? Why do I have to go to a class? Why can't I have it where I want? So this is a real interesting design problem. How do you get really high impact at a really low cost? Not obvious. Definitely not doable in the old way we used to design stuff. Definitely not doable. But I don't know if you know the company Foursquare that allows all of us to get credit cards. That's low investment, high impact. Right? Tremendously high impact on a very, very low investment. You can take credit cards. Do you know that? Every human being, everybody can take credit card payments. Before, you had to fill out forms. The bank had to approve it. Da, 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 da. Just one example. Twitter changing the world. You know, revolutions are based on Twitter. I mean, we have lots and lots of examples where people are, with very low investment are getting a very high impact. Interesting. We all know this guy, right? You do or don't? Yes. Oh, yes. You haven't met him, but you know a lot of us. So he has lots of great quotes. You can Google it or Bing it or whatever. Yahoo it. One you like, I like is you can't solve problems by using the same, same thinking we use when we created them. But actually, the whole motto of instructional design development is use the exact same thinking to solve the problem as the problem is. That's been our problem. We never really have accepted this, in my opinion. These are all just my opinions, not endorsed by STD or anybody else, by the way. Um, so this is the context for today's session. All of this, I call it the alphabet soup. And this one you're probably most familiar with, right? Addy, analysis, design, development, implementation, evaluation, uh, business process redesign. I don't even know what lean stands for. Maybe Pat will tell us. Six Sigma, human performance, technology, agile, SAM. This is Michael Allen's new thing, critical mistake analysis, uh, came and went. But this is the one we're most familiar with, yes? Yes. Have you studied it as a science? Is that a yes or no? Do you know the history of it? Do you know who developed it? Yeah. Yes, you do. Who developed it? Who developed it? Military. The military. When? Oh, 1902. Yeah. After World War II. Why? Because they needed to codify their training. They needed to codify the training? They had to train a lot of recruits at birth. Right, but what was really, really important? Same the military. thing every time. Same thing every time. Yeah. Every time. You, totally yes. controlled. Da, da, da. That was that. Because after the war, that's what the world was like. Very slow, very predictable. And now we're still training people this way, unfortunately, using this. But people have, it's really, this is interesting. When I've done this presentation, we've gotten into huge fights because everybody says, well, Addy can be anything. Well, I do Addy, but I do all this cool stuff in Addy. So what, the, what I want to try and set up is this SIG, and what we want to think about is it doesn't really matter whether you do it inside what you call Addy or not. This is not a debate about Addy. What's the debate about is how to do better learning design. And somehow, every time we did this, well, I don't know who was there, but we, Veronica was there with, uh, over in uh, Mount Diablo. I had to spend 10 minutes trying to get the group to get off the fact that it's not about whether Addy works or not. This is not about Addy. This is about doing better learning design. If you want to call it Addy, go ahead. I don't care. But it's about what's better learning design. So here is the history of Addy. Just so we know, it, well, that's my time's up, okay. It was a very structured process it began in, before 75, it was codified in 75, and then all these things happened. The whole key to what my problem with this is, people have made changes to a process, and Addy has a very strict rule. You and that, analyze, you design, you develop, you implement, you evaluate. Right? That's what they do. That's what it does. Now, what people have done is they've really innovated around each of those a, those things. They've done analysis differently. They've done design differently. They've done develop, development differently. Very poor on implementation, and they've pretty much given up evaluation to Kirkpatrick for some reason. <laughs> because everybody can remember four things. <laughs> Don's a nice guy. Now you got his steps. You got his daughter-in-law. Oh my God. Um, we'll never break that. Um, and you have, the, and you have uh, uh, Patty and Jack Phillips writing the book on ROI, so this is a problem. 
I wrote a book on implementation. You know, we're trying to get people to move implementation. But a lot of the work is here in this first ADD kind of thing. But the thought about it is, it's, it's all about analysis, design, development, implementation, evaluation. These other processes, some of them don't do that. Some of them don't start with analysis. Wow. Some of them go from analysis to development. They skip design. Some of them go from analysis to implementation, and they skip development. Each of these have, and we're going to hear today about Agile and Lean, right? Mm -hmm. They have a different philosophical basis. So what I'm hoping you will engage in is not trying to make Addy better, but to think about what it is that we can get from each of these other great methodologies that will help learning design be better. Is that, am I making a clear distinction? So this is not a, a, a sig about adding. It's not even a discussion about adding. It's a discussion about learning design. And how do you make learning design better? And hopefully, it's not how do you make this better, because we're not trying to improve adding. We're trying to improve learning design. And I think it's really powerful today to begin with Lean and Agile, because these are really powerful methodologies for getting things done that don't follow this model. They don't start with analysis, design, development, implementation, evaluation. You're going to hear they really attack things differently. If you like what happens, and I guess Susan and Paul like what happens, what we're hoping the SIG will take on is invite other people, like Pat, who have expertise in these other methodologies. And the idea is to have experts who aren't design and development experts, although Pat does have both hats. But today I want you a lot in the Agile Lean hat, and less in the design and development hat. What we want to do is put experts in front of you who are not instructional design experts, but are people who know these methodologies. Share with you the methodologies. And then together try and say, wow, what can we pull out of this that we could use not to make Addy better, but to do better learning design? Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Nobody is doing this. Michael Allen wrote a book called From Addy to Sam, Promoting His Successive Approximation Method. There are a couple articles, if you've been here, Google now, uh, I think it's a woman, writing about Agile, using Agile for learning and design. You maybe refer to that. Uh, I haven't seen anybody on BPR, Human Performance Technologies, so the ISPI model. So the whole thinking here is, if we can let go of improve, this notion of improving this and really focus on learning design, and we can really take from these other, other processes, we actually could get a design process that would be improved, that would be functional in today's world. Because each of these have great attributes. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm really excited about it is because nobody's taking it on. And I don't want to do it. I'm done. <laughs> I'm at the end of my career. I'm not doing any more design development. It takes people who are working every day. I'm not working every day on it. So it takes people like you who are engaged all the time, who can listen to people like Pat and go, wait a second, we could do blah, 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 blah. Or wait a second, could we do so, da, 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 da. And then that would get infused into ASTD and hopefully make a change in ASTD, which is really pretty much addy focused. And you know, that's what I'm hoping to do. That's why I invested my time to come here and plead with you to take on this case to take this on. Um, he's my, my guru, Frank Lloyd Wright, because he has two great quotes. This one I really love. And if you take out architect, put in learning designer, it really you get it. Every great learning designer is necessarily a great poet. He or she must be a great original interpreter of his time, his day, and his age. Rather than remaking a 1970s process, which is what people spend a lot of time doing, trying to make any better, why don't we jump into today? and go, we need a design process that is really flexible, really fast, happened yesterday, works on mobile devices, right? Bring your own device, bring your own learning, you know, has the best of Agile, the best of Lean, the best of SAM, the best of HPT, and the only people who can do it is a poet, and you, you're those poets. I'm hoping you're gonna be those poets. Somebody is gonna take this on and, and, and figure this out. I don't think it's one person, that's why I think it needs a, a group of people hammering it out, I don't think it's one person. One person that's like Michael Allen writing a book on his idea. I don't think it's one person's idea. That's why when Veronica and the, the six have you take it on, I don't know, this is something to like, It needs a group of people who will take it on, not one person. Does that make sense? Because I don't think this is one person being smart. If it was, I'd already figured this out. <laughs> I think it's a group of people who are working trying to, you know, 
bounce ideas, which is why today we're going to try this out. Pat's going to be the expert on lean and agile, right? And my direction to Pat has been try and talk about what are the inherent characteristics of these methodologies that could be used in learning development. Not to make you lean experts and not to make you agile experts, but to give you enough so that you understand enough about what the methodology is that you might identify one or two really good tools or processes from this methodology that we could use in learning and development. Does that make sense? So we're not trying to make you agile and lean to experts. Just to listen to what she says with a learning designer's ears and be open to, wait a second, we could try that. And the idea to try and do the scenarios is we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we'll find a gem in this, maybe we won't. Do everybody understand that? You're, you're engaged in a process that we don't have an answer to. Is everybody okay with that? You're not so okay with that? Is that you really gave me this not okay yet? I'm an improviser. You're an improviser. <laughs> so I figured you'd really be okay. That's why when you shook your head, it threw me off a little bit. So the, the, you know, Pat doesn't have the answer. I don't have the answer. I don't think one person in the room has the answer. That's why we set this, this up as a SIG problem. And we'll work through the scenarios. And hopefully after today, if you like it enough and you like this idea, I guess then Susan and Paul are going to think about it, you know, bringing in these other experts. So this is sort of the, it's almost the, not quite the kickoff, but the sort of the prototype. It's sort of the pilot, but a little bit more than that. That's what you're engaged in. Everybody got that? Does that seem something you want to take on? Yes? Of course? All right. Well, I hope you do take it on. And since today is sort of a pilot, design pilot, prototype kind of thing, it's going to be a little rough around the edges because, you know, Pat and I have only talked a little bit. She's agreed to be our quote-unquote guinea pig. She's our first outside expert. Be nice to her. She does, the great thing about Pat is she is also a learning design and development person, but I don't really want you to focus that. I want you to focus on her agile and lean expertise. But the good news is she also does a little bit with what you do. So she's sort of a bi person, you know, both. Because later on, we might bring in people who don't know at all about learning design. So you have to be really nicer to them. Who will only know about their methodology. So Pat's agreed to be our guinea pig. She's going to, you know, lead you through a little bit, uh, try to give you enough that you can be dangerous, but not enough to be competent, which is what learning designers tend to spend our time, right? And we're going to do two, two, two rounds, two scenario rounds. Okay, around. So we're trying to get in two tonight. So again, we don't know whether two's too many, two's too few. We don't want to keep you up to nine o'clock. So just hang in with this thing, okay? Is everybody okay with that? Is that a yes or no, or maybe? Yes. Yes. So now the other good news is I don't, I can't stay for the whole end of this. So I'm going to hear about it later on. But I wanted to come to be here to kick it off because I just think it's an important thing. And I hope you see it as an important thing, too. Um, if you want to hear more about my shtick on this, as I said, you can go to my website. There's a slide you can download. If any of you are members of the eLearning Guild or, or know anything about the eLearning Guild, they're, some, they're doing a webinar on Wednesday, next Wednesday the 9th, I'm doing on this topic for them. Uh, there are recordings of it. So you don't have to hear me do this, but if you want to hear the whole hour spiel, you, you can get it. But you have enough tonight, again, as I said, to be dangerous. Any questions about what we're engaged in? Did, was I coherent at all? Because I actually rewrote it in my head the whole hour and a half driving down here. So this is not where I started with this morning when I thought of what I was going to talk to you about. But does it make sense? Yeah? OK, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pat. Awesome. Did, you Did you I set guess? you up? For, Absolutely. Well, the it questions were, perfect. so the question, come on, Pat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we've been dialoguing about what to ask the experts. Pat agreed to be our, our, our first expert. And I was trying to say, it's not, we're not asking you, Pat, to make us experts in what you know. But what we're asking you is to help us understand what are the, so the critical attributes of these processes. What makes yes. lean good for lean, not in instructional design. Yes. What makes agile really good in what it's ever used for, right? right. And then once you say, this is why, why is it good? So what is good about it, and then why? It's, you know, and I'll just make up, it's fast, it's this, it's that. And then we want to make the bridge to how could that therefore be used in instructional design? Right. So that's the question to you. What are the cool. key essential essence of each of these processes you're going to talk about? Mm -hmm. What are the attributes that might be attributed or used in instructional design? Mm -hmm. cool. Is that a, is that, that a fair direction? 
Excellent. Is that a talk? Okay. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you.